Hello, curious people, and welcome to our very small and spontaneous uh, uh, speech on the design thoughts and the design process of uh, Do Android's Dream. Um, we uh, know that some of our players are uh, here and are we're curious to hear more about it, but also other people that have heard about the game. So we were inspired to, to make a little uh, speech about the full process and not just the results of it. Uh, but first, uh, we want to introduce ourselves and the people that were involved that we luckily have here. Yes. So, introduce yourself. Yes, I am Carl Hublum. I did sonography for this. I planned it and built lots of the stuff, but I had help from others, of course. But I did design and practical stuff. And I did uh, game design, uh, character design, and uh, sort of we bounced the overall concept back and forth between us. Uh, then we also had uh, a wonderful character coordinator and a character writer go up here and say hello. Their name and who you are and what you do. Uh, I am Annalisa Kaldmukas and I wrote characters and GM during the event. Uh, <coughs> and I wrote characters. And then we have uh, the runtime GM that I was going to call up, but he <laughs> came up himself. I'm so fast. Um, my name is Stefan. Um, I um, was the, in charge of um, making sure things ran smoothly, uh, handle all the problems that might come up with people, uh, and making <laughs> sure that uh, all of these guys had food and were happy, and that our helpers that came and helped uh, had food and was happy, <laughs> making sure that everyone felt good and could deal with whatever come before them. It was also the, yeah, the third hero who woke up an hour before everything every morning. <coughs> we had our meetings. Yeah, um, I also ran uh, workshops. Um, yeah, and yeah. DMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way the game was structured, I will sure. yeah. 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 was that we had three runs. Uh, that ran Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, oh, one more thing. We are part of an organization that is called Ariadne's Red Thread, and that's all of us, and also Elina in the back over there. She's also part of this uh, wonderful team of people. Uh, and now we will start from the beginning. Yes, and how so <laughs> uh, It was totally awesome to work in this group of people, because people were so good at doing what they were doing, it was really fun and a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are all awesome. Yeah. Okay. No. No. Yeah. Uh, do it that way. So, uh, this began uh, last summer when we were really uh, exhausted after a lot of other big things that were happening, and we were sitting in my couch. And I said something dreaming about, I want to do a LARP about, you know, eating noodles in the rain. <laughs> and Carl said, uh, like, uh, one year or two ago, I had this very freestanding vision of it would be cool building a, a, an alley with like cyberpunk aesthetics with plastic <laughs> and rain and stuff, because that's a challenge in itself. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that sounds pretty much what I had in mind. Um, and then we started a search for a venue, because we didn't want to design or decide almost anything because it, before we had a venue. But we decided that we were going to get a specific venue, Daily Morning and in Gothenburg, which we are very grateful to have a uh, cooperation with. Uh, and then we just started discussing, okay, so what is this game about? Just bouncing ideas. And it was clear from the beginning that we wanted to focus on a feeling rather than come up with a story first or what we were going to subject our players to <coughs> or any of that. We wanted a feeling. We wanted this feeling of, of the rainy city. And uh, he was confident that he could get it. Yeah. Uh, bouncing ideas. So, and then we thought, okay, but we have a really small black box. Uh, we needed some interesting techniques. We were also talking about how to mass market LARP. We, and these uh, are connected, yes. Uh, we thought about like, okay, but we need, we want to design a game that could be run over and over again with different themes. We, could, we wanted to take a, this game and just slap another theme onto it 
and use exactly the same stuff and just run it as a different LARP. So we were going like, yeah, a Jane Austen LARP in a black box. Uh, a dark prison LARP in a black box. War. War in a black yes. box. Uh, and developed this technique called the crossroads that I have my uh, Nordic LARP talk about. I will not be so detailed about it here later, but I will at least mention how it worked. Uh, so we started uh, designing things. And the same day that we did this, I took up a paper and said, it's not hard designing a game. Look here, Carl, I will just make some examples. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, next. No, sorry, having the same So I painted on a paper, it's like, you just need a group and a couple of other groups, and you just connect them like this. And uh, then you have conflict because these don't like these and these don't like this. And uh, then we essentially said, oh, I guess we can use because now we've made it. Uh, and this is only <coughs> because we want to give you all an inspiration that designing a LARP doesn't have to be iteration upon iteration of, of checking and testing and thinking and bouncing back and forth. Sometimes you can go with a feeling. As long as you want to know what feeling you want to give people, then just design around this feeling. What kind, of, what kind of conflict do we need for this kind of thing? So we wanted to base it on the movie Blade Runner. And the easiest thing to do then was to just look at the movie Blade Runner and see, oh, what <laughs> scenes do they go through in the movie? And each of those scenes or themes became a group in the LARP. They were in some kind of brothel restaurant thing. Okay, let's make that a group. Uh, then we had another situation where they were in an abandoned house in a back alley where the law didn't seem to apply. Oh, that's another group. And then I just started drawing lines between them and connecting them logically. Like, what would, the, would these people be attached to these? What would these think about them? And then we, were, of course, just stole the plot from Blade Runner. We wanted to keep the LARP as about, once again, about a feeling, so let's not spend all this energy on making a super unique plot, because that wasn't the point of the LARP. So we had four people chasing four other people. And the four other people were dying soon, so they wanted to live longer to find the creators that had designed these androids. But we are also very interested <coughs> in humanity and what makes us human. Uh, so we said that, okay, but we, let's have hidden androids in the game. Let's have people that are wondering themselves what they are. We're really fascinated with LARPs that makes you question what you are, why you are doing things, uh, that make you your, your own enemy or your own like confused friend. Because things that come from the inside are often very, very much more powerful than things that are told that you should feel a certain way and so on. And then we started, we just added a couple of questions, like what are the implications of being an android? What do they feel? And we quickly decided that we did not want to run it in the Blade Runner world. That world was a sort of sexist world made in the 80s uh, with very traditional uh, roles and uh, a world that was more classical dystopian. We just instead decided to put it in a future social democratic Sweden, but in like 200 years from now, uh, or at least just an anonymous city. We didn't have a name for the city, we didn't have a name for any of the organizations because we wanted to have the focus on the feeling, not the details. <coughs> so yeah, with that uh, sort of a very basic idea. Uh, and that was yeah. the same time? Yeah. Okay. Then uh, we uh, started thinking, okay, how to make this real? And then Carl got to work over a yes. couple of weeks time thinking about stuff. <laughs> Um, yes. Started with commercials, yeah. With commercials, yeah. Uh, the first thing I started <coughs> with was just photoshopping stuff and learning Photoshop because that's fun. Making like messages. How can I make messages that shape how people interpret their world? So very like dark nihilistic <laughs> attempts <laughs> of like live life and why be yourself while well, well, you can be part of our co company and stuff like that. And to like try to shape how the players thought. That became quite a small part in the actual game, but for me it was very important. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, I was part of making uh, the game The Solution this summer, which Elina was <laughs> in scenography uh, boss for. And there we carried so much scaffolding and stuff and built walls and heavy things. Uh, which made an uh, interesting scenography, which like made you feel small and inside stuff. Now I wanted instead to make a scenography where this is the important thing. I get like drawn into something in the middle of the room instead. Well, I can relax in a feeling and instead of building so much anonymous surfaces, uh, I wanted to make like details and the fun stuff, the darlings. Only like the, the right pencil for the future, the right kind of paper and stuff like that. The things that get your imagination ticking. Remember you have to... Yeah. Yep. Um, and the way we work together is more or less... Uh, <coughs> Simon is not very interested in aesthetics compared to me. He's like, I can play this character in any environment. Ish. And I'm not that interested in character writing. So we were quite like working on our own teams, but we wanted to have some kind of core to get back to, so we didn't have to like bounce every decision back and forth. So we had two things, which at least I used very much. This is a palette of colors picked from the movie. And they are like, I just Googled palette, and they just put them together from screenshots from the movie more or less. Uh, so I used that as my own imagination or um, frames for colors and for the character for the players. So I said to the players, like, this is, I would like you to use these colors um, in your clothes. And so also we had the quote, which was on the website, <coughs> uh, which was. About the feeling. Also, it's about the feeling of sitting at a little bar in a dystopian futuristic city where it always rains, drinking your worries away. So, I'm like, how do I build an environment where I can feel this? So, we made several environments. Um, where is that? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I want to make a dark game. It's sonographically dark, because I like darkness as an alibi for doing things, or not doing things. Um, especially in like this dream in a holistic future, it was like... Uh, just sitting doing nothing is a bit annoying for some character uh, players, so we want to help people with it. Uh, we wanted, yeah, efficient scenography, which was the same, like, how do, how do I focus on the things that actually give me something in this environment? In this room, it might be the, like the projector, or this, because I'm looking at that, or, and the feeling of having you looking at me. The rest we can just take away. It, the door doesn't give me anything, the ceiling doesn't have to be like that. So the points of what's, yeah. Um, Look at the screen. The yes, yeah. just having my notes here oh. at the same time. Uh, also, we wanted <laughs> darlings because that's fun. That keeps my energy for the project. So, for example, we had one character being a spare a android spare part smuggler, and a person asked, like, "What do I do? Is it like chips or like joints of metal?" No, no they're biological. The people. So you're. Basically, like chopping people's arms off and stuff like that, and sell them to the Android. So I wanted to make body parts. And if you have seen the movie, eyes are like, referred to and used. Uh, so I made eyes made of uh, egg, egg whites, boiled, in, and then I put some um, contact lenses on. And one person got this in the game. But whoa, these are my smuggled parts. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and things like that. Just, I, I love it because it makes uh, this is a bit over the top from what you uh, expect. So suddenly you get more pulled into like, whoa, I'm really surprised by this. This feels real. So it helps. Um, so we had a black box 
the, this part is a big black room and this part is a big white room. Then we have a small kitchen and a small room and toilets and so. So we wanted to make these zones. Um, I will present them. Uh, the back alley uh, is like yeah, the streets um, where criminals live. The police office, we have the company, which is the name of the company because it's so large. There is only one company. Uh, the Red Lounge is the brothel uh, luxury restaurant lounge and the noodle bar is the noodle bar. Uh, Purgatory is like a nightclub uh, and the apartment is everyone's apartment. So I'm only get back to this. <coughs> and the crossroads is the bus station in the middle where you have to go before you go into another zone. This is Simon's area. He will get back to um, and I wanted every, or we wanted every um, zone so you didn't have to cross over any other to get here. You, if this was large, you would have to go through the police office to then go to the bus and then go. Yeah, so we wanted everyone <coughs> to be in connection. <coughs> it worked quite good, as, uh, but this was a bit harder. You had to go through the club to get to your apartment. Okay, the back alley. It's a bit dark, but yeah. Uh, this was my main inspiration. It's just street market feeling with like layers on top of layers with fabric and so. And I would have loved to have a sprinkle on top, just rain dripping down, and you wouldn't have seen the 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 night sky, uh, which was my vision two years ago. But and that would be outside then because of water and so. And yeah, another one with more neon signs. So this is how it looked without the sexy lighting and the darkness. We build a scaffold in center, and then we just put lots of uh, food plastic wrap. We bought like 900 so meters or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and just had people running around with it, like covering and making walls and strips and tearing it apart and so on. And then we had a uh, street artist who came and did graffiti on it. This is like the, the more boring part. So you spent a few hours making a really nice painting in the park, <coughs> like being a cityscape uh, and making it feel even larger. And small nihilistic messages like utopia, die, stuff like that. And uh, yeah. And they could climb on the scaffolding and stuff like that. This is uh, an android sitting in some plastic sheets. And this is the crossroads. So two pictures. <laughs> this one is up here. Um, we had uh, we covered all the floor in plastic because it. it it gets dirty, you just wrap it all together after in game and you barely even have to like vacuum the floor. And also it created the effect of a like wet streets. It looked so nice in reflections from different lights and so on. All through the game, we or all through the design I want to use as like pointed uh, I don't know like a uh, small surf um Small lights instead of floodlights all over. Yeah. Um, so like, this is more interesting than having like a ceiling lamp. And this lights up in my face, and I can't see you, but you can see me. It's it creates different effects, and also it puts light on the interesting stuff, and makes everything else that is ugly go away. <coughs> so I spent some time with a nerd, which I found, or they, he found me, uh, and he want, really wanted to make some cool signs, so he helped out with that, and even made a large dragon from the movie, uh, which will appear in the next, I think. And this is a bus stop, so they're sitting at uh, some chairs, uh, waiting for the bus. Okay, the Red Lounge. Inspiration, inspiration, location, location. Um, I wanted it cozy and classy and intimate. Um, 
we needed two parts. So this is like the lo uh, lounge area where people could sit in right in chairs and drink ginger uh, shots or uh, sip tea or stuff like that. And nice carpets and lots of fabrics, also small points of light and quite low down uh, with lighting. So it's not on top of you, but uh, lower down. And we had four booths for uh, the prostitutes and the companions. companions. Two classic ones and two shabbier ones to make some status difference. And the police office, inspiration, inspiration, location, location. And here, I think this was the only one where I had like a flood or a spotlight from above because it makes this more boring surrounding or a feeling. And so I had like two computers uh, giving some light and one yellow uh, annoying one from the top. And we had screens, which was like just two screens but being uh, projected up to seven of them. <coughs> We had a table fan, which I like because it's in the movie, and it's it's um, tactile. It uh, it's a fan. It blows you in the face, so <laughs> you feel it there. It's nice. um, we had a point comp test also, which is the test that determines if you're an android, if you're a human, which was an old desk lamp with a uh, webcam. webcam in it, so they could like pointed at people's eyes and sit and watch into it while they were chatting with the game master about how the test was uh, gone. And we used a wonderful lens filter from a theater lamp. So you could yeah, with a shutter. <laughs> uh, the noodle bar, my favorite and everyone's favorite, I mean. We had, we built this um, from really simple uh, building material and bought like plastic floor mats from Bauhaus uh, building store uh, which had, had nice texture on it so it felt very professional and real and uh, then we had one game master playing or serving food everyone could go there sit and like could they have a, some noodles and it? yeah sure she bought noodles and put them in uh, like cartoon boxes and gave them and there was uh, some extra things you can have, have on, so soya and sauce and stuff like that. This is the dragon, which was on top of it. Okay. And this was like the introvert space, you could have small dis uh, discussions and talk to the noodle barista, and so it was very appreciated. And the last two, Purgatory, which was the dance club thing, and the company which, yeah, the company. Um, the dance club was a bit too large and empty, so if we do it again, we'll make it more cramped and small because 30 people won't dance at the same time in a room if you don't make like the end of the line and have real DJs and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> and in the company, we had two areas. One was like the large uh, executive desk, a really heavy, nice wooden desk. Uh, with a computer and we had like the board meeting uh, place so we had creators in one area and like the board in one area and they had different views on the company and what to do oh, okay it's me yes uh, is it okay to have it this dark or should we light it up again i think if you're talking it's nice yeah, to it's see your face yeah uh, <laughs> <you're laughs> <that's laughs> nice, nice in the back yeah <laughs> Not, not that it's not nice to see your face, Carl, but the pictures are more important. No, we will display them on my face. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just going to go through uh, a number of uh, choices we made that we all we think work really well, and it's like a recommendation when you are making games. But so far, it's been about how we thought and how we executed, but this is also how these techniques worked. Uh, there's an excellent movie about the crossroads that will be put up on Nordic Dark Talk, but I will give you a very brief, uh, <coughs> brief variant of it. Uh, in games where you want to uh, create a larger setting in a small black box, uh, it works really well, we found out, when we came up with this idea, to put a waiting place in the middle. Uh, the crossroads 
was a bus station here, where when, whenever you wanted to leave an area, like Carl explained, you would had to go. We should instruct everyone. You had to go to the bus stop. You had to sit down, mm -hmm. and you had to wait for at least two minutes. Uh, those two minutes were meant for introspection, for monologues, for talking to a stranger, because even if you had gone there with a friend, that person was no longer your friend when you sat down at the bus stop. They were a stranger, and so you could say whatever, you could do whatever, or not do, but you could say whatever, and they would react as if a stranger was, an anonymous stranger. They would go like, mm -hmm. yeah, you should probably do that. So there were these small conversations, and when that person held their monologue, you were just a stranger listening in, or somebody could comment on it. Um, that was Crossroads. The apartment, like Carl said, was uh, an area where anyone that went there entered their own apartment. So whenever the door was open, your apartment was available, and you could go there to have a private scene, or just to have a feeling of home, and so on. And when it was closed, you couldn't reach your apartment at that point. Uh, if you could, then we would have five of those small rooms so everyone could be in their apartment at the same time without having to decide each group's apartment. But it was a really nice way of creating a feeling of being able to go to different parts of the city. And it can be used in games whenever you need a home for one or several people. And the Nihil Essence is a <coughs> character writing uh, method that we tried for the first time here as well. Uh, where you, instead of writing light side and dark side into characters, you can give them those functions to players instead. Uh, you can give someone a function, you are someone's essence, that means that you have a responsibility to go to that player and try to lift them up, try to make them stronger, try to make them believe in themselves. While someone who is, if you're essence, or if you're a knee heel to someone, you have a responsibility to go and push that player down to make them not believe in themselves, to make them despair and uh, wish that they would be dead. Or make bad choices. Or make bad choices, or betray their friends and so on. And this meant that everyone had at least two people that were sort of dragging them, or that was the theory. Um, computer terminals is something we really, really like because for some reason it creates an entirely different feeling of reality when you can mm. communicate with something outside of the game that can give you even the simplest responses. And here they could communicate, the police could communicate with their own database and with police operators. The company could connect to the secret Android database and retrieve information of who was an Android, uh, when were they created, what were they created for, and could therefore receive information about this uh, one secret that we had in the game. Uh, because we believe generally in a lot of transparency in our games. All the characters were available to read and uh, the game structure was entirely transparent. But there was one thing that people did not know as players and that was whether they were or were not an android. Uh, so they could take the test or they could uh, make the company find it out and so on. We used an act structure for the game. The act structure was more there to allow people to have flexibility in their play rather than to really uh, jump in time or introduce new elements. Uh, and it was mainly to have, like, you had the, the first act was daytime, where you uh, could, uh, where like people were still working and you could have more regular conversation, it wasn't heating up yet. And we wanted a rather boring first act. Because we have this principle that we want to introduce boredom into all our games. Uh, because we find that in the long game, or even in nine hours game, boredom can add a lot to someone's experience. They might not know it for the first three hours there when they sit and feel that they don't have much to do. But even a small conversation or something you just pick up on in these boring three hours can mean a great deal in the end. If you're entirely action-packed right away, then only those things will matter. Well, boredom gives you a chance to pick up on much smaller and subtler things and make use of them. Also, in, if you internalize the boredom into your character and not yes. as yourself, it can create creativity. Like, I'm bored, what should I do? Maybe go do this or this, and like use it as creativity. And what would your character do if they were bored at, at work and so on? It creates a normalcy that many games are lacking. Many games have this extraordinary feeling where no one really knows what the characters feel like normally. 
and boredom gives people a chance to experience that. Also, this was uh, something I wanted to use in the in the scenography. Like instead of you being like overwhelmed by sound and people annoying you in game, and you would like to go off game and sit in a room, not because you want to speak to someone off game or so, but because you're tired of the noise or people, then I wanted to design like an in-game zone where you could go instead. So you could go to the red lounge and like just have a nice sit down and drink something and relax in game instead because if you have a, spe a specific need we could cater to that specific need uh, so we don't have to go off game for that need um, we also are sort of opponents against social off game rooms uh, we don't want uh, games where that are, we don't generally want off game rooms that are meant for hanging out and talking to people because we also think that it, it's tempting, it's nice, and we don't want people to have a nice, comfortable, tempting time outside the rather rough or at least uh, like intense game. We want people to have those moments in-game instead, that people are, try to find something that gives you pause and make you think. And if you go off-game, it's just too nice. Of course you can go off-game and talk to the organizer and get help when uh, if something has happened, you must be able to reach an organizer and, and talk off-game. But not for hanging out, not just for taking a break. Uh, yeah. That was a small little tangent of the design principle. But it is a design principle and we encourage people to try it and tell people that like, off-game is for needs, not wants. That was act one. Yes, that was Act 1. <laughs> uh, act 2 was when uh, something we called the decision. We wanted Act 2 to be where people started making choices rather than just picking up on small things and uh, so on. Uh, and then we had Act 3 which was consequence. Where people died, where people declared their love, where people realized they had no chance and tried to run away. And that brings us into the three endings. We didn't want a game with open ending. Yeah, I see some misery. <laughs> uh, we didn't want a game that would allow a sort of, oh, you know, and then you sit and wait, and then the game ends, and you may want, like, you don't really know what happened. We want a game where at least everyone had made a decision or knew what had happened to them. And yes, it's a bit inflexible to have, like, right on the web page right away. Your LARP can only end in three ways. You either fall into nihilism and stop caring about everything and just drink yourself to death or something, or not die to death, but drink yourself to nihilism. Or you kill someone or you get killed yourself. Or you escape the city and because you felt some hope or some kind of connection to someone. And we made it very clear that escaping the city was an almost guaranteed death. <laughs> we, we called it the death lottery. <laughs> we told you not to have hope. I was so you... disappointed when I survived. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <we're going laughs> that direction. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a very minimal chance to survive. <laughs> uh, and we used a technique that was inspired from uh, just a little loving for that part, where we had a, depending on how high risk of a life you had lived, then the different chances of dying. Uh, now, we're going to talk some about, not the game itself, we're going to talk some about the characters and, uh, and designing them and how to make them come alive. Uh, so, I would like to welcome Siri and Mukasa up here. Yay! <laughs> Yes, uh, and uh, either of you can pick the questions, I suppose. But I uh, would like to ask you uh, both. Is that filming? Should you stand to the left? <laughs> it is. <laughs> no pressure. It's fun. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask you both for a short reflection on writing characters for for this design uh, that we have made and how you uh, how you found it. Mm. Um, for me, it was really relatively easy. It was very very structured. Um, the relationship parts were, because of the nihil and, and essence mechanic or design choice, uh, everyone got equal amounts of relationships. Okay. We don't have to stop quickly. 
I have written in my face. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> you made it worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. um, so it was yeah, relatively easy to just. It was a very simple structure where you needed to just fill in everything, and we since every person has guaranteed four relationships, relationships have specific um, uh, functions functions and roles, and you just fill it up with whatever is logical. <laughs> Maybe to explain for those of you who didn't see the characters, mm -hmm. we could quickly run through that you had like a description of what your character is like, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of background, and then there was uh, information about the two different zones or groups you are a part of. So for example, you could be uh, part of a red lounge zone or that back alley zone. And then you had a social group uh, that often correlated with the zone, but not necessarily completely. So you also had contact surfaces to other uh, zones <coughs> in the LARP uh, on top of the hills in essence. So that gave like a lot of different levels of characters and relationships to interact with. And you can choose how much to go for the different uh, relationships yourself during the game. And then in the end we had a short uh, with uh, like an important memory or memories for the character. And if you, the character has reoccurring dreams that like is in the front of their head. Which was one of the, I think, only ways to discover that you are an android. With, if you did not have uh, any access to the police or the company's monitor. Uh, because the androids have the same dreams as other people. Yes. Uh. Yep. Uh, I would like to hear uh, if there were any, like, if you would have done it again, would you have want to change something in the structure or what, what, uh, would you have enhanced something in, in the character writing in the process or? We, I think we have been the yeah. same. We should have sat, sat, sat down and uh, Gave, given everyone their needed in essence first in the beginning before we started running, writing the characters because unfortunately we started we did not write at the same time Siri was was fast and efficient <laughs> and I was not uh, so she picked she picked her needle in essence for her characters while she was writing them of course and I picked mine later which meant that there were a few of the characters that did not have ideal choices they were not completely logical. We did as well, good as we could to make them as logical as possible, but yeah. it, that could have been better. Yeah. So it should have been part of the initial structure of all the structuring the characters mm -hmm. and groups. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, do you have anything you want to say uh, about the game as a whole, either as a player or yes. uh, as a... I was privileged enough to actually get to experience the LARP, even if I was a part of the design team, because uh, Simon very graciously said, yes, you can write the characters, but I want you to be able to play it, so you will not know any of the secrets. So you had a very, uh, very <laughs> intricate system of me being in different documents in our Google Drive working, and then gradually they would be moved into the secret folder, which I couldn't access, uh, so I couldn't see any secrets. Uh, which made it interesting. I actually had the wonderful experience of sitting at the noodle bar one uh, late rainy night, having an interesting conversation with an uh, android <coughs> who told me my off-game childhood nightmare to me. Because obviously writing the characters, I was running out of dreams and I started putting in random dreams I had myself into other characters and had a nice little meta moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the important parts for me. I think you did not do this, but we we too we wrote the char every single character as a human, and then later changed the small details that needed to be changed if they were uh, an adult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, now we're going to go on to the game itself, and just uh, some short uh, reflections on on uh, what happened and uh, things things we could learn from this and so on. Now, it should be said that very many of these things were sort of experimental and, and the game was meant to be a lot more uh, spontaneous and minimal effort and you know we, we just wanted to organize a quick game see if anyone wanted to come uh, and uh, that gave us liberty I think to experiment more uh, it literally went something like oh hey Carl I just decided that we have an, a three-act structure and that we have nihil in essence yeah. I, I think I saw the, the movie like one week before we launched the game or something like oh I've seen it a few years ago it was boring let's see it again oh, okay let's do game one one week later we did all the work for the launching in one day and launched the website uh, so uh, 
that is probably my, my the biggest thing I want to give away is uh, the potential for be just following your inspiration and trying things uh, rather than trying to make sure that they are perfect uh, before you even uh, before you even try them. Uh, also, uh, like lotteries are great. <laughs> Some small, small random chance in a game that is otherwise entirely directed by you creates a very powerful uh, experience.